How's it going, YouTube? Hope you guys had a wonderful Thanksgiving. I know I did. The last month has been a rough one. Um, we're getting into the holidays, so you know things are going to slow down, get a little stressful. Uh, keep your spirits about you, talk things through, work together with your coworkers, and you'll be just fine. We go through this every year. It's nothing new. Um, just remember, it's not that bad. We can always... Um, learn from we can always learn from it okay um anyways i'm not gonna ramble on about that too long i just hope you all are doing well so i've been away for a while guys um busy you know busy so anyways uh before i start this case study uh and sharing it with you i just want to talk about a couple products i think are awesome and if you don't know about them great uh this maybe will give you some I don't know, help in making a decision whether or not you want to try them. Um, I don't make any money on these products, so keep that in mind, but I think they're awesome products. Uh, first one is these Matco socks, okay? These are bamboo socks. They're made from Matco. Uh, they come in gray. They come in black. They come in white. So, you know, I've replaced all my socks with these, and uh, <clears throat> they're the bomb. They're about $6 a pair, so they're not cheap. I give them away as Christmas gifts as well. Family loves them. Uh, they feel like a brand new pair of socks every time you put them on. Um, just, you know, really good at waking moisture away from your feet. Uh, they're, they're just very comfortable. They last. Um, they do get holes in them just like any other sock. But, uh, you know, for work and stuff like that, these are these are the bee's knees, or as, as they say. Um, so if you don't have these, maybe get yourself a few pairs off the Matco truck and give them a shot because these things are awesome. I ordered what like 30 pairs of these things <laughs> oh man yeah i spent a lot of money on the truck <clears throat> just for socks but you know what it's worth every penny okay next product i wanted to talk about and uh you nissan guys probably know about this stuff um honda bond and other products are awesome too but this Asin gasket maker is the bomb it's black it's uh forms up in about one to two you can see the uses on there hopefully you can see that um bump forms up in about one hour um one to two hours you know to fully cure up and then um timing covers you know pretty much any aluminum surface to aluminum surface uh this stuff is awesome permatex makes good stuff too i love their high temp silicone sealer i love their uh, anaerobic sealer um, you know, I love Permatex products, but this stuff is eighteen fifty a tube. At least that's what I'm getting it for from the guy up in Napper. Um, my boy up there, he's hooking me up. Keeps a couple of them on the shelf, thanks to me and my former service manager when we stumbled across it doing Nissan uh, timing jobs. So uh, if you don't, um, if you've never used this stuff, try it. I think you'll like it. Mopar makes a good product too, um, but that stuff right there uh, is nice because you know even if the surface does have a little oil drop or something when you're putting the pan up you don't have to worry about it too much because she'll seal okay um not too hard to remove either the stuff is very thick it's very thick um and just like any sealer like that um you want to give it a little bit of time to kind of tack up before you stick her on up there okay so try that stuff out give it a shot um order yourself some up that's my personal use stuff. That's why I buy it. Um, you know, I'll have the shop order me some if I need it for a job. Nevertheless, I wanted to get into this case study with you guys. Um, I'm in my boy's bedroom. I had to kind of sneak away because my younger daughter is running running around in the halls and she she's a two year old, you know, going on three. So <clears throat> there's that. Anyways, let's get into this case study and uh, I'll share with you what happened last night at work when we're leaving with this car and uh, kind of walk you through the process because I think it's a good um, learning experience for those of you that may struggle with some of this stuff. Um, and trust me, you're not the only one. We all struggle. Very basic diagnosis using a test light, incandescent test light and an LED test light. Um, very simple circuit. Um, very easy um, once you wrap your head around these basic concepts. Okay. So stay, stay tuned. I'll get up a wiring diagram once we get to that point, but I'm just going to give you a quick rundown of what I had. Okay. All right, guys. So here's what we had. We had a 2011 Buick Regal with a two, four in there. Um, there's the engine code, the CXL. This is a gas direct injection engine and it's VIN C. Now a little history on this car. Um, when it originally came in, before I, I, I touched the car, I'll let you know when I actually got to the car here. Um, 
we did end up finding, they did it, well, we, meaning our shop, we did end up finding a broken guide for the timing chains. Um, chains were done on it, cam actuators were done on it, cam solenoids were done, and the plugs were done, okay? Pretty pretty straightforward. Uh, mileage was, you know, 110,000, give or take. Um, the codes that were originally in it were the P0011, one four, you know, for our intake and our exhaust position system performance, um, the zero zero one six and the one seven for our crank position uh, on the intake and exhaust uh, um, cams uh, positions, they were not plausible. So these are the codes that were in it. Um, now these codes here, these codes were also in there <clears throat> when this thing first came in. Um, and again, I wasn't the tech that initially looked at it. But um, what was called on it was, of course, the timing chain job. Now, uh, all that aside, it did need timing chain. So, you know, that job, with that job, um, of course, uh, you know, we're going to clean the, the throttle body. The throttle body gets cleaned. You know, you do the idle relearn. You do the crank variation relearn. So reset your fuel trims and, um, you know, basically confirm the repair, right? Well, you got to be careful because, um, and I'm just kind of going through my notes with you guys, but you got to be careful when you clean these throttle bodies um, on any car, to be honest with you. But on uh, when they're really carboned up, real dirty and real old, um, you know, or haven't been serviced and kept clean sometimes, and I'm not saying this happens a lot, but I have ran into this and actually did recently where I actually had to have the um, PCM reflashed on a Tahoe to, because the idle re relearn would not, um, the computer just wouldn't relearn the idle after cleaning the throttle body. Okay. Um, so keep that in mind when you're cleaning excessive dirty, um, throttle bodies, it can cause more problems. So, you know, you kind of got to pre-warn your customers that, Hey, we're going to clean throttle body. Um, there is a possibility. It doesn't happen often, but there is that possibility guys that you're going to have issues with that. Anyways, moving on symptoms of the car initially when it came in, um, you know, before the chains were done was, um, it was running rough, uh, you know, so rough idle, very poor running. Um, it was misfiring, but it did not throw DTCs for the misfires. Um, and this is information I got from the tech <clears throat> that initially looked at the car um stalling intermittently and and of course runs but uh very poorly okay so after the initial repairs which was the timing chain job like i had shown you um you know it wouldn't stay running um it was stalling on my coworker, and yeah my coworker was the one that did the chiming chains you know it was stalling on him after the timing chain install um, it ran great. Then it would just like intermittently stall out and wouldn't stay running. Okay. And the DTCs that were set, um, in it <clears throat> at that point, after the timing chain job, we had three, these hard, these were the faults that were stored in there. Um, were a P0030, a P0036 for the, um, oxygen sensor control circuit sensors one and two that would be the upstream and the downstream oxygen sensors um and then a p0102 for the math sensor circuit um, for low frequency then a p0443 for the evap purge solenoid uh, valve control circuit okay so those were the codes that were in the scan tool in the snap-on modus that was hooked up to the car when i arrived on the scene so to speak um, these were the codes that were set in there now uh, let me continue on here and so I'm just trying to make heads or tails in my notes because I had to get it out of my head. But history round two, so to speak, after the timing, um, the, the tech was re you know, and I, I hadn't arrived yet to help him with this. This was him still struggling with the car. And we all have those days and it's frustrating. You know, he's rechecking his timing. He thought he had, you know, set it out of time. Um, he was doing a cylinder leak down test on the uh, on each cylinder um you know wasted time um and, and the reason i write wasted time is because you know we got to look at um we got to look at your dtcs that are set and and kind of you know use common sense uh well you know just use logic to think why we're having the issue but nevertheless he was frustrated you know he's he's mad he's wasting time he noticed that the harness uh was loose at the O2s, after looking up on Identifix, these those codes that set, and again, those codes that were set, 
were these ones right here, these two oxygen sensor control circuits, the MAF control circuit and the EVAP herd solenoid um, control circuit. Now I wanna tell you that once we look at the wiring diagram, I'm gonna show you how to quickly um, narrow in on the problem just by looking at a wiring diagram and understanding circuit design and how things work and you're able to pinpoint it quickly. But he was frustrated, okay? And you know, electrical, not exactly a strong point, but you know, we have to learn sometime. Nevertheless, uh, moving on, uh, he came to me <clears throat> and, uh, of course, asked me for my thoughts at this point and was frustrated. So at this point, I came over and I, and I had looked at it and, again, um, noticed those DTs. You know, I'm like, hey, hook up the scan tool. Let's look and see what those codes are. And we'll document them and then we're going to do a uh, – we're going to clear them and uh, confirm that the clear took uh, and see if any hard faults are there. And um, – you know, this is kind of my plan of action in my head as we're moving along. And very quickly, it didn't take me long to figure this out. Um, with his help, of course, me and him kind of went together uh, to figure this out. But um, all the control circuit DTCs, okay? So when you see all these control circuit DTCs for all, you know, for the purge cylinder, the MAF sensor, and the oxygen sensors, okay? All control circuit codes, you should immediately be thinking, I've got a power feed issue. At least that's what I was thinking. I'm not saying that you have to think that. I'm just saying that that's my first thoughts. Um, the other thing is, is the 443 for the purge solenoid control circuit was a hard fault. I mean, happening right now, resetting right after a code clear, okay? That's a clue right there. Um, what fuel, uh, you know, I'm thinking what fuse powers my purge solenoid valve at this point? Uh, and then, of course, I'm going to consult the wiring diagram and examine the circuit. So let's, um, before we do that, uh, just to give you a quick synopsis of what we used, all we're using here was the snap-on modus edge to pull our codes, the Mac, uh, a MAC LED test light, an incandescent test light, light to test the circuit, and then, of course, the protoman wiring diagrams. Um, <clears throat> so let's get into the wiring diagram. Let me walk you through this circuit, and let me show you my, my thought process on it, and hopefully this will be helpful. Okay, guys, so of course, you know, I'm looking for the power feed. Um, what we're going to look for here is we're going to look for our purge solenoid, okay? Now, my purge valve solenoid um, is on page four here. I've already looked through this, you know, for the sake of time. So let me get to the purge solenoid. Okay, so you can see here, here's our purge solenoid. And what I want to do here, and knowing GMs, I know that pink black wires are always on my power feed, but it doesn't matter. You follow either wire. If you look at this green wire um, and follow it back, it's going to go to the PCM because that is our control side of that solenoid, okay? So this is our power feed, this pink um, black. What I want to do is I want to follow this all the way back to find out where it comes from, and it's going to come from a fuse, guys. Um, it could come from the PCM, don't get me wrong, but it's going to come from a fuse. So let's go to that fuse. Okay, so it come, that power feed comes from this fuse right here. Fuse 47, it's a 10 amper. Um, <clears throat> and that gets its power from this um, engine controls ignition relay, which is a switched power. Um, you can see that that power comes from a um, hot at all times power feed on that side and this wire right here on that side of that relay is the control side of that relay um, PCM controlled of course which shuts that switch and provides the power to these three fuses now the fuse we're concerned about is fuse 47 of course this 10 amper okay now it's important to note uh, as I was tracing this wire back um, and I showed this to my coworker as well this is the key um, this go this wire uh, this fuse here powers up more than just our purge solenoid, okay? And I'm going to show you that. Okay, so as you follow that wire down, you will come to this junction spot. And you can see that there's three junctions here. And, uh, well, yeah, three three splice points, so to speak, but four different wires um, that are branching off of it. Now, this is key because looking at this splice point is how you how I came to the conclusion of where the bad spot was in the wire because that's what was wrong with this vehicle at this point. <clears throat> so let me show you um, on my drawing here because it's a little easier to understand um, where these go quickly by looking at this. So again, we have that fuse right there, fuse 47, 10 amp in our battery junction box under the hood. This pink black wire is going to power up 
these four circuits. Now it's important to note this one right here has two wires coming off of it and then it splices down to these. Now look where these go. These two top ones here go to the oxygen sensor heater um, control circuit and these are the battery positive feeds to our oxygen sensors. Same here on this um, splice point, the purge solenoid, okay? Purge solenoid and our MAF also shares that feed, not the intake air temp sensor because we cannot be sharing what powers with our intake, uh, our temp sensors, okay? Because the power feed is the signal wire. Not gonna go into that, but I just wanna give you guys a quick down and dirty of where those wires are going, okay? This is key because if we look at our codes that were set, they were all control circuit codes initially for both the oxygen sensors, the MAF sensor and our purge solenoid, okay? Now, looking at my notes here, it's important that we remember our DTCs. We're gonna attack the purge valve circuit and fix the car, why? Because that's a hard fault. Um, the other codes are related. Why are they not hard faults, right? Speedy Diog, if you understand the circuit design. Check for 12 volts at the purge solenoid or do we check for the uh, fuse 47? So, okay, so do we check for power? Where do we go? Do we check for power at the fuse or do we check for uh, power at the purge solenoid? It really doesn't matter on this car because um, we can just, you know, we can go to either one. They're both easy to get to. Um, I went straight for the fuse because, hey, it's right there. It's easy to check, grab a test light, do we have power on both sides of our fuse? So let's go to fuse 47 with the test light. And what do we get? We have no power correction. We have power on both sides of the fuse with an LED test light, okay? Nice and bright on one side, but dim on the other side, okay? So if we have a nice and bright test light on one side of the fuse and we have a dim test light on the other side of the fuse, okay? Why is that? The answer is it's voltage drop across the fuse, meaning we had a partially open fuse. The fuse was blown, but it wasn't fully blown. So when we removed that fuse 47 from the fuse box to inspect it, we noticed that it was blown, but it was partially blown. So the first thing is, is it's okay, like why did this fuse blow, okay? Um, obviously there had to be a short at some point to ground you know, do we have a shorted solenoid? Do we have a short in the wiring? Um, how come our oxygen sensor control circuit codes are gone? All right, how come those went away and only the purge solenoid and they're all sharing the same power feed? What is that kind of, where is that leading us um, in our diagnosis? Now keep in mind, when I arrived on the scene to this for this car to help out my coworker, he was already inspecting down by the oxygen sensors, okay? So let's go down to those oxygen sensors. So if you look here on the wiring diagram and you follow, follow, oh my goodness. So if you look at the, on the wiring diagram, these pink black wires, now they can be either or color. Ours were pink black, but you can see that this wire here goes to the heater circuit on th this uh, downstream oxygen sensor. You see how it says sensor two and then sensor one, <coughs> excuse me, this power feed coming into this heater circuit. So. My coworker's already down. You can see right here where they draw these these connectors here, but they don't give you color f to the actual oxygen sensor, okay? They never do on these diagrams. But he's already down here checking this wiring and wiggling it and trying to figure out, you know, is this where my problem is? Because, the, again, the loom is all damaged, and anyone who's worked on a 2-4 with that kind of mileage knows that usually the loom's all falling apart, brittle, whatever, right? And he was in the right direction, okay? Coworkers in the right direction. Um, so the next thing I suggested, you know, we do, we, we know we got a volts drop across that bl partially blown fuse. So of course we're going to put a new fuse in it um, and see if it blows, right? And of course it's not, it, it, it doesn't blow. We put the new fuse in and it's still, it, it, it doesn't blow. Um, and we have a good power feed now at our fuse. So the next thing uh, we want to do is just clear the codes and recheck to see if that 443 for that purge solenoid goes away, okay? Um, and of course, it did not. It, it was a hard fault 
you know, right then and there, comes right back after replacing the fuse. Now I'm asking myself, why? Why is this fuse uh, not blowing? And how is it that the per solenoid is still throwing control circuit fault um, even after providing good power to it? Well, why not at this point just go straight to the purge solenoid and test to see what our power feed looks like uh, looks like using our test lamp, okay? And that's exactly what we did. Now, we could use a scope. We could use a multimeter and check voltage and all that, but it's not necessary in this case. Uh, a simple test light um, is quick. It's down dirty. Well, it's what's available. I'm not walking all the way across the shop, guys. Um, to grab my test light when my coworker's got his LED test light there. You know, we're just going to do a quick down and dirty look. And sure enough, we go down to that purge solenoid and let me show you on the wiring diagram. We go to the purge solenoid <clears throat> to this feed here, okay? Unplug it, take the test light, you know, hook the battery negative, of course, and touch it to this pink black wire pin on the connector. And of course we have a dim test light, just like we had on the fuse. Um, of course, now we have a nice bright test light on both sides of the fuse, but the one uh, when we're down at the purge valve, we still have a dim test light. How can that be? Well, <clears throat> we have a voltage drop. Somewhere from the fuse to the purge solenoid, there is voltage drop. The only re the reason we have a dim test light, okay? The reason we have a dim test light is because we have either a resistance problem in the wiring, a partial open, again, resistance problem, um, Essentially, that's it. We have a voltage drop and we got to find it. So, you know, getting back to this system with this splice, you know, this is probably where my problem is in my head. I'm thinking that. I'm like, well, okay, they all share the same circuit. Did, you know, the fuse was partially blown. So something had to short to ground. So I know I have open copper somewhere in my head. I'm like, it, it just has to be, okay? And, <clears throat> you know, the next thing... The next thing I told my coworkers, I'm like, hey, just hold that test light on there and let's do a, um, let's do a quick harness wiggle test from the purge solenoid connector, um, you know, across the back side of the valve cover there where all the coils plug in. And let's start unplugging things um, that are on this circuit and see what happens, okay? So we start unplugging. We start with the math. Uh, I start with the mass airflow, no change. Um, I unplugged the purge solenoid. The purge solenoid is already unplugged because we're testing right there at its power feed, and we still have a dim test light after unplugging the math. We um, go down to the harness connect. Uh, you know the two connect connectors from the actual O2s, the upstream and the downstream. Easy to get to backside. Again, this is where our loom is missing on those wires going to the connector um, that leads to the oxygen sensors. Right, the the two connectors, and and. Unplug the upstream O2, no change, still a dim test light. Unplug the downstream O2, and sure enough, our test light goes out. Now, why would our test light go out if we unplug our downstream oxygen sensor? Well, let's think about that. So, if I'm unplugging things, and I'm testing at this purge solenoid, okay, again... I'm testing, whatever, we don't really even need that. I'm testing at the purge solenoid, right? With my test light, hooked to battery, negative, and I have a dim light. I unplug my mass airflow, no change. So that tells me that my voltage drop is not along this part of the circuit or here, okay? Is it possible that I could have, um, I could have a partial open in this harness right here before the purge solenoid? It is possible. But if you think about it, my test light goes out at the purge solenoid when I unplug my downstream oxygen sensor. And the downstream oxygen sensor's heater feed, okay, up here, look how this is spliced in, okay? I unplug my upstream oxygen sensor and the light still is dim. So that tells me that this part of the circuit here is not our problem. Where our problem is, guys, is up here after the fuse just before the splice point it has to be in here now the reason i know that is because if you do plug everything back in and you go to your mass airflow power feed it's the same as the purge solenoid dim test light you go to this oxygen sensor here same thing dim test light okay dim test light when we unplug the connector to this oxygen sensor, 
so again, unplug the downstream oxygen sensor, the light goes away. What I'm getting at here is that we have a voltage drop. Again, we are tapped in here with our test light hooked to ground, right? So this is our test light right here, and I'm not very good at drawing it, but that's lit dimly. We're hooked to ground. We're testing at the purge solenoid. We can test at the mass airflow. We can test here. We can test here, and no matter what, our light's dim. We unplug here, or not here, rather. This connector here that I was unplugging was actually cutting power to everything because of this splice point, okay? So all the power went away. That tells me that I have resistance somewhere in here, okay? We could do the same thing if we were to just cut this wire um, and then using a test light or, you know, yeah, using a test light hooked to ground, we could test here. And if we're after this, this resistance point or this partial open in the wiring, okay, where it shorted to ground and there was a rub point, very small little uh, burn slash rub point on that harness where he was looking, he just missed it. There was a very small little spot where that pink black wire had touched the block, okay, and shorted this fuse, but it only shorted it partially, partially. All right, guys, the video is getting long. I apologize for that, but interesting, right? Didn't take long to pinpoint using simple simple voltage drop testing using a test light, okay? Um, keep that in mind that the wiring diagrams might be not always right, but they do help you get in the right direction quickly. Now, the reason my coworker was struggling is because he went on Identifix, and I'm not not knocking this at all. Like, it, you know, goes on Identifix, searches for the codes, and they pointed him towards a shortened harness somewhere in that area. Okay, so he was in the right direction, and he probably would have found the problem. The problem uh, it might have taken him a little longer. The problem is, is unless you understand, you know, look at the codes, look at what codes you have, use simple logic. Um, think about it a little bit more, go to the wiring diagram, trace everything out. What does everything have in common? In this case, those oxygen sensors, the mass airflow sensor, the purge solenoid all shared that power feed. Okay. So when you see codes like that, you know, oxygen sensor, heater circuit, bank one, oxygen sensor, heater circuit, bank two, that's both the oxygen sensor heater circuits that are throwing, you know, codes. Okay. They threw codes. Um, you're, purge solenoid in your mass airflow and the car is still starting but then intermittently stalling how can that be well they those sensors were getting their 12 volt feed okay they were getting their 12 volt feed <clears throat> but they weren't getting a full 12 volts due to the resistance in the wire because the wire had rubbed through and shorted that fuse okay so by replacing the fuse yeah, we were able to get more voltage out there and, and, and get the car running, but it would still um, fall on its face intermittently. Okay, I, I hope that makes sense. Very interesting, very crazy, but very easy to diagnose using simple voltage drop. Now, I would love to have shown you on the car. I just wanted to share this with you guys that, you know, we found the bad spot in the wire, of course, and fixed it. Okay, and then again, after we fix the wiring, wrap the loom up, all that good stuff, you know, we have a nice bright test light at the purge solenoid, got rid of the hard fault, vehicle ran great, and we're done. And my coworker was like, dude, thank you so much. And I'm like, I know this is what this is what it is. You know, that's just understand circuit design. Um, I think going through. Um, you know, you got to go to the wiring diagram, just kind of understand the circuit. And once you get an understanding, um, just use basic um, the law of deduction, you know, go to the fuse. And then, you know, from there, you know, had we not gone to that fuse, we would have never found the partial open. What I find interesting is, is that that fuse did not blow all the way. So that means it was able to give enough voltage, enough current flow, even with the resistance in that wire to those sensors to actually allow the vehicle to start. Okay. And, um, wasn't throwing those oxygen sensor codes till later because the oxygen sensor heater circuit, for whatever reason, like it wasn't being monitored 
when he'd get it started, it wasn't able to monitor it long enough, I guess. Um, <clears throat> so kind of interesting, uh, pretty crazy. Um, and of course, what made this even worse was this vehicle had an intoxilock on it. So don't drink and drive, guys, because I've been there, done that, and that is not fun. Um, and, you know, the intoxilock, you got to blow in it before you start the car and all that jazz. So pretty crazy. Uh, interesting case study. If you guys have any questions, drop them down. I hope uh, you found this useful. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm trying to make it as brief as I can. Take care, guys. Hope you're doing well. Thanks for watching. Thanks for your support. And I'll uh, catch you on the next one. And uh, hopefully I can get some in-shop filming done tomorrow. I'm going in to do some timing chain job on uh, Ford. But we'll see. Anyways, take care, guys. Peace out.